Good morning. Good morning, church. All right, would you take uh, the next 30, 40 seconds to connect and get to know somebody in front and behind there and connect to your Lego pieces? If you don't know what that means, you got to catch the messages online. Plug in. You see somebody sitting by themselves, tell them, come on, come sit with me. You can help me take care of my kid. <laughs> amen, amen. There's, there's tragedy and there's miracles. And as a body, we get to go through it together, amen? And that's why we need to be connected. So I'm really, really excited today because all of my grandbabies are in the building. We've been waiting for a long time. And so, so you get to, to sit back right now and hear the miracles, what God does. Amen. I want you to welcome Jason. Yeah. Amen. All right. <laughs> wow. Sanctuary. It's been a while. Oh, thank you. Love you guys. <laughs> My last time on this stage actually was September 24th, 2017, uh, which is about 25 weeks ago, uh, a little over six months, about 183 days. Uh, it's about a little over 4,000 hours and about 16 million seconds. You know, who's counting, right? <laughs> so God bless you guys, man. Thank you for having me back. Uh, Thank you. Though I've been able to attend here or there a handful of, full of times within the last six months, it is my wife's first Sunday back in a full over six months, so <laughs> welcome my wife back. Spoiler alert, we didn't come back empty-handed. Uh, we also haven't slept in about four months, so uh, don't stop praying is what we're trying to say. Uh, keep going. Um, but the reason I bring all that up is not to boast just yet, but I am going to do a lot of boasting today, amen? Um, the reason I bring that, I bring that up is because I actually want to thank all of you for a second. Uh, there's not very many congregations that you could step away from for that long of time and still feel connected, right? Uh, and that's the one thing my wife and I felt was a connection to this congregation and to the people here and to what was happening. The truth is we missed a lot. We missed a, we missed a lot of milestones. We, we missed a, the annex, I guess, it was not only finished but dedicated. I didn't even know. I came back, the floors are gray. I mean, it's a lot. That's what I'm trying to say, you know. You guys did a lot while we were gone, and we missed all that. But there was still this thing that we felt like we were with you every step of the way. So there's a few things that goes into that. And one is that it's beautiful because that building healthy families thing, though we take that immediately to do it for our own families at home, there's something that we built here that's really healthy when you can step away and still feel like you belong. Is that, is that beautiful? All right. And that's a testament to what you guys are doing here. It's not just the leadership. It's not just us. It's not what's going on up here. But there's something about what you guys did. The second thing is that I felt so much encouragement, even when I know that a lot of you were going through your own heavy, heavy storms. You just kept flooding us with encouragement, whether it was messages, physically coming up to us, uh, text messages, Facebook, whatever. Your prayers were so appreciated, even the very angry ones. Where's Laura? Right, Laura? Or you battled with God and said, God, I need to hear you right now. They were appreciated. So as a thank you, I came up with a little something that um, is a kind of a surprise, uh, even though it kind of got leaked yesterday, but whatever. Kind of a surprise that I've been working on. Uh, as you guys know, I'm a musician, and so the only way I can really say thank you is through music, right? So in 
the last six months, though I haven't been able to come, most of my time with you guys has been spent online, whether it was watching live or going back and uh, listening to the worship and to the uh, preachings. And so that stuff is what really kept me personally uh, going. And it was the testimonies that were set up here through not just our pastor, Pastor George, but also through uh, all the ministers up here, Pastor Mark, Mo, Ephraim, uh, ministers Lee and Josh, everyone who ministered, Pastor Gary, even through the storms was telling us to keep that faith. Amen. And it was so amazing to me that I, that I did something for you guys. So back in January, I think I think I wrote the date down. Let me look it up. It doesn't matter. It was a message that Pastor George preached, and he spit some fire, right? It was a, he spit a little, a little spoken word, right, that he was like, yeah, bars. So I was like, all right, let's put something to those bars, amen? So if you guys have that video ready, this is called Deeply Loved by God, and this is my thank you to you guys. I am a mess. I am a mess. I am a mess. that said, I agree. I am a mess, but deeply loved by God. Inspired by that was my sermon for today, deeply loved by God. A little bit of history about that, though. What you guys don't know is that was really hard to pull off. You know, I live with Pastor George. I don't know if you guys know this. My studio is in his basement. Do you know how hard it is to make a song and surprise Pastor George when he's in the basement? So I'm, I'm not sure if he's surprised by that, but I hope he is. And <laughs> So as a thank you, if you want to, this is not a promotion to me, but on my website, I put it up so you can download that track for free. You can also go on YouTube and watch that as many times as you want to. Um, it literally is my gift for you guys. I know it's not the greatest gift, but it's just me saying thank you for your prayers and thoughts. And thank you, guys. All right. So with that said, I'm going to ask you guys to stand with me one more time, and let's get this, let's get this started. Close your eyes as I read the word, meditate on the words that are being said. In Psalms 139, 16 through 18, it says, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. Lord, we just want to thank you for that. We know, Lord Jesus, that there's so many things to be down about. There's so much that we're going through. But this morning, we thank you because you are still with us. In the midst of our storm, you already knew and you were there. Thank you, Father God, and we ask that you prepare us today. Lord, silence my voice. Lord, speak through me, Father God. Deaden my thoughts, Lord Jesus, and may yours come alive right now. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. Amen. You may be seated, of course, yeah. So on September 24th, 2017, my wife and I walked out of this building for the last time, and we were enter into our new season, the season that we knew would not be easy, that we were somewhat prepared for, but still a little bit shaken up to know that we were about to go into that. A little back history about it, if you don't know what's going on, what we're all referring to, uh, back in Mother's Day of, or that week of Mother's Day of last, uh, yeah, last year, uh, we found out that we were, after almost two years of trying, uh, God bless us with a baby, right? And we found out we, my wife was pregnant and it was amazing. About a month later, we went to the doctor and the doctor was like, oh yeah, you, two, you're having twins. And we were like, oh, snap, that's stressful, right? So we were, <laughs> so we were like, yeah, that's great. Um, now, I must warn you, there's, there's going to be a few times where I'm probably going to get a little choked up. You don't worry about that. Yogurt don't cry. If you don't know who yogurt is, don't worry about it. Okay? <laughs> we'll move on. As many of you may or may not know, though we were extremely blessed to find out that we were having twins, it also came with very difficult news just minutes later. We found out that my wife was carrying mono-mono twins. I don't know the exact terminology for that. I am not a doctor. Forgive me if some of you are. In a nutshell, apparently it means that there are two babies in one sack, which is extremely dangerous, as you can imagine. Uh, a lot of twins have two different, their own different sacks. They're allowed to grow and to feed and, and do what they have to do. But when they're in one, there is very high risk. The percentages for miscarriages, preemie births, and birth defects are so high that the doctor literally encouraged us to terminate our babies right there and then. We were told that one baby will probably die, if not both. We were told that my wife would need to be seen weekly and admitted to the hospital for medical bed rest at at least 24 weeks because it is highly unlikely our, that our children would be able to make it past that date. If they were to make it at all. At 24 weeks, they would have a 70% chance of death if not severe birth defects. 70%. We sat there and we looked at each other and we felt so strongly from God that this was his miracle and that he would take care of our children. So my wife and I decided to not go with the medical staff's opinions and what they believe was the right decision. And we said, no, we believe in God. Thank you. We were prophesied over and confirmed through word that our girls would in fact be okay. And it was Minister Lee, actually, who came up to us and told her that God told her clear as day that our babies would be fine, but it was us that she had to pray for, the parents, because they knew that it would be our, 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 our struggle with, with, would be the struggle, not our children's. It is a really difficult season, but it showed us one thing, that we are not in control, and that's Okay. We had to remind ourselves that the Bible says that everything will be okay. In Psalms 23, 4, it says, even when I walk through the darkest valley, we guys, you guys know that verse, right? But it's just sometimes you got to reread these really popular things that even are posted all over the world, right? People that don't even talk Bible, you know, oh, do I walk through the shadow, right? It's all, it's in movies, it's in songs, whatever. But, you know, let's read it. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, which means the most creepiest, I can't see in front of me, I don't know what's going to happen, I'm scared, I will not be afraid. For you are close by me. Your rod and your staff protect me and comfort me. Here's a side note reminder. It doesn't say that the valley will not be dark. In fact, it clearly tells us, hey, when you walk through that dark time and you go through those things, I don't know where we get this misconception that when I accept Christ that nothing is ever going to be bad, that everything will be smooth sailing, that it will be smooth from here on out, that nothing will ever go wrong. That's just not true. The world doesn't work that way. But God says when it does, though, Here's the difference between when you accept me and when you don't is that I will comfort you and I can get you through this. Just believe. Forget believe. Just understand it because it's happening whether you like it or not. God is there to get us through it. And no matter how dark the valley, God was in control in our whole season. I'm going to read Ecclesiastes 
that's really hard for me to say. So if you know how to say it, uh, you know what I'm talking about. And this is chapter three. And we, we read about something that I've read over and over again. However, it continues to minister to me every time I read it. Does that happen to anybody where you read the same things or you've heard it preached on and then all of a sudden it takes on a different meaning, right? I'm actually going to read this, so bear with me for a second, but I guarantee you it might be kind of cool, right? So verse 1, it says, For everything there is a season, a time for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to harvest, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to cry and a time to laugh, a time to grieve and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace and a time to turn away. A time to search and a time to quit searching. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to, te to tear and a time to mend. A time to be quiet and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. The Bible says there's a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. What people do, what people do, well, excuse me, what do people really get for all of their hard work? I have seen the burden of God, the burden that God has placed on us all, yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart, but even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from the beginning to end. So I conclude there is nothing better than to be happy and enjoy ourselves as long as we can. And people should eat and drink and enjoy the fruits of their labor, for these are gifts from God. And I know that whatever God does is final. Nothing could be added to it or taken away from it. God's purpose is that people should fear him. What is happening now has happened before, and what will happen in the future has happened before. Because God makes the same things happen over and over again. I've always understood this passage to be about allowing us the freedom to feel like we can go through difficult times, right? It's okay for us to cry when we need to cry. It's okay for us to, to, uh, to have frustrations when it's time to have frustrations. I always tell people, when people see me angry, they go, Dad, Jay, right? I thought you was Christian, right? Don't you hate when people, somebody says that at you at work? I can't get frustrated. Even Jesus flipped tables, I tell him. Even Jesus was like, Ugh, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I haven't flipped a table yet my whole life. Can't be that bad. It's telling us that the road won't always be easy, and that's okay. You're not crazy or in sin. It's biblical. This world will challenge you with heavy trial and tribulation. But I have to be honest with you. I always skip that last portion, right? I didn't quite understand it when it said what is happening now happened before and what will happen in the future has happened before. God happened, happened, and things will happen. What are you talking about? I don't really understand that. But all of a sudden, in this season, it became sort of clear to me. And I think it's trying to tell us that whatever, whether it's good times or bad, rejoicing or sorrow, whether you're watching life enter this world or exit, God remains the same. His promises never stop completing. His love never stops pouring down. His mercy and grace continue to renew. And his commitment to you is seen to completion. This morning, I am blown away by this realization. This verse that I would skip over and that I would cherry pick and, and, and the good parts and leave out the bad parts. And all of a sudden, I'm realizing that the part that I left out was the greatest part of this whole chapter. That whatever is happening, God is still in control. He's seen it already. He knows it's happening. This is not new to him. Your situation, as big as it is, is not a surprise to him. And he's still in control. I may be a mess. You may be a mess. But we are deeply loved by God. In Psalms 94, 18 through 19, it says, I cried out. I am slipping. But your unfailing love, O oh Lord, supported me. When doubts filled my mind, your comfort gave me renewed hope and cheer. 
That was a verse that ministered to us while we were in the hospital. That was a very, those two verses right there were the very verses that we read to ourselves to encourage ourselves to know that it was okay to cry out, I'm slipping. I can't do this, God. But your unfailing love supported. Family, in this season, I had to learn that with every emotion I went through, there was purpose. There was always a plan. However, you can't go to new levels without taking steps. So many of us want to take that imaginary elevator straight to the 10th floor, but the reality is that we cannot get there unless you take the steps to get to that next level. And sometimes those steps are difficult. Let's think about the physical. You can walk up two or three steps, no problem. Walk up five flights and see how your legs feel. Burns. I don't care how good a shape you are. Some of us take breaks, right? It takes time. It hurts sometimes. But to get to the destination, we must go through that because that's what we have been called to do. There's learning in that process. I want to show you guys something, and maybe uh, this will help make this thing a little more interesting. I have some pictures, okay? <laughs> some of these pictures are going to be maybe a little embarrassing, whatever. Some of them might make me emotional because maybe you haven't been through what I went through with these pictures, but I'm going to show it to them to you anyway. And I tried not picking too many graphic pictures because I wanted to really make it, but this is, uh, some of this stuff might look a little crazy. It's okay. I'm going to walk you through it. On November 20th, my wife and my daughters... My wife and I daughters uh, survived, not just the 24 weeks that they told us that they needed to survive, but they went on to 32 weeks of what was considered an impossible pregnancy. We were told to abort and to start over. We were shown the overwhelming evidence and how statistically our girls wouldn't make it, how highly probable it was that one, if not both of our daughters would not survive. However, it is very difficult to believe in God when your wife is in another room recovering from one of the most traumatic events of her life, and I have to walk into a room to meet my children, and they look like this. Seeing tubes and machines keep them alive. It's very difficult to believe that God loves me when I witness a nurse rush over to my daughter Haven to resuscitate her. Not so she can breathe, but so that her undeveloped lungs can receive oxygen from a machine that is breathing for her. It is very difficult to believe that everything is gonna be all right when my daughters are barely four pounds and are just slightly bigger than my hand. It's difficult to believe when a nurse looks you in the eye and tells you they're doing well, but she's not saying that because she believes it, she's saying it because that's what she was trained to tell you. Pick number two, please. There it is. Good job. Leave it there. <laughs> we good. But there was hope. Even when the machines were forcing life into their bodies, they would open their eyes as if to say, ah, I'm okay, mom, I'm okay, dad. Seconds turned into minutes, and minutes turned into hours, and hours into days, and days into weeks. That we sat there next to them, praying our hardest to believe in God's promise. We tried, or what we would hear nurses after nurse, and doc after doc tell us that, we'll see. They're doing okay. We'll continue monitoring their progress. Which wasn't the most encouraging thing to hear, and we ended every day with very little hope and almost no strength at all. Next pick. But then one day, we didn't need, they didn't need as many tubes to help them breathe. They showed us through smiles and test results that they would continue to prove God right and defy the odds against them. Show them pick four. <laughs> and this is when we started seeing their personalities here a little bit. <laughs> one was a clown, one not so much, okay? Pick five. 
There were such fighters that instead of doctors and nurses coming to the conclusion that they should remove their feeding tubes, as you saw in the previous pic, they ripped the feeding tubes out of their own mouths. Once again, proving that God's timing supersedes the timeline of medical professionals. Now, don't get us twisted, okay? We had major setbacks all along this whole process and this journey. Watching the monitors second by second, telling us that the heart rates were either too high or too low, breathing was abnormal, they weren't getting enough milk, and we had nurses telling us of all the risks of them receiving tubes and getting all this stuff put back in, and that we weren't allowed to take them home in this condition. You understand, Mom and Dad, they're doing okay, but not good enough to go home. They need us. And there would seem to be no end in sight. And even though it wasn't that long of thinking back at it, but it was the longest time of our lives. It might as well have been 10 years, you know. But they were breathing on their own now. They were gaining weight and eating on their own. And anyone who's familiar with this process knows that in order for you to take premature babies home, they need to have all of that happen without a hitch. We got to the point in our journey where the doctors finally told us, okay, mom, dad, if they can go five consecutive days without any issues, no lowered or increased heart rates, no breathing issues, you can take them home. Then they would have to survive a car seat test. Anyone heard of that, right? Most times when you don't have a premature baby, you just bring the car seat, you take them home. But if you have a premature baby, they have to actually put the baby in the car seat for about an hour, 45 minutes, and make sure that all those test results are clear, that they don't have any uh, uh, Brady's, right? Is that what it's called? Uh, medical term, whatever. Brady's, so that they don't have any, uh, any, any heart issues or anything of that nature. At this point, we're so close, and we could be, we're like, oh my God, this is happening. This is getting great, because they, they wouldn't do this if they weren't ready to send them home. But the very next morning, sorry, Mom, sorry, Dad. They failed the test. Haven did good, but Brooke didn't. Maybe we'll send Haven home and make life really hard for you by having one twin in the hospital and one twin at home, but, they, but you won't be able to take them home today. My wife and I were getting pretty frustrated, and Christmas was quickly approaching. <laughs> and we were saying, God, we want them home. And I heard that there was a member of this church here saying, if I, saying, God, I want them home by Christmas. And she put the man, she's like, I know I'm your favorite, God, so listen to me, she told me. <laughs> we don't know how this happened, but we showed up to the hospital and showed them pick six. And they were dressed. God's timeline doesn't care about failures or setbacks. It doesn't depend on medical facts or man's opinion, and thankfully does not depend on our lack of faith. Because on December 23rd, 2017, we dressed our daughters to come home. Next one. You can show them the next pic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mind you, at this point, they're still about five pounds only, um, just barely bigger than my fingertips of the middle of my arm here. But they were screamers. <laughs> <That's what she laughs> Lungs were fine. <laughs> Pick nine, please. <laughs> On Christmas morning, we celebrated God's miracles. We celebrated God's never lying, never failing, and never late love. Show them pick 10. That's mom. I has. Pick 11. Mom got me back. Okay. Uh, pick 12. <laughs> pick 13. That's big sister. Pick 14. There you go. Stay there for a second. This is the day that we celebrated. We probably mixed them up, and that's okay. You know what I'm saying? We knew that there were fingerprints and that we could probably eventually figure it out. <laughs> and we were like, all right, you're this one, you're that one now. Is that cool? And we all agreed. 
And we were like, right, let's start dressing them different because this is getting hard. <laughs> All right, pick 15. This is a bit of a sad day for us because on February 11th, 2018, we had to readmit our little ones back into the NICU. Um, they had RSV. But when you've carried, and listen to this part very carefully because I believe someone needs to hear this this morning. When you've carried the heavy burden of an entire season on your shoulders for as long as you've had to carry it, much like a weightlifter, you become stronger. And what you weren't able to lift yesterday, today, you could lift. One night in the NICU didn't matter to us, so we was cool with that because we had just spent months, months living in this hospital. We knew all the codes, right, babe? We knew where we can get free food. We knew where, we knew all the nurses they kept visiting. Jay, what's up? I was sleeping on the bed with them just like that. You see how one of them is not sleeping? Do you understand the pain that we go through? How one's sleeping? You see this? This is every night. One wants to be awake. They're never on the same page. All right. Pick 16. We brought them back home and everything was fine. Show them pick 17. Pick 18. 19. All right, yeah, go ahead. 19. They're getting chunkier and chunkier. They're smiling. Pick 20. Now, check this out. Um, if you haven't noticed, one of them is, is, like I said before, is more gangster than the other one. One is the clown, <laughs> and one is just like, no, nah, you got to earn my smile. But I promise you, she smiles. She just doesn't, <laughs> she's just more like, well, tell me something to laugh at. Don't take a picture. You know what I'm saying? Where the other one's more like her mom, like, yeah, I laugh at everything. <laughs> so what is God teaching us? That they're starting to develop these promises, these, that God's promises are so real. They're starting to develop their personalities. And all of a sudden, everything that God said he would do, he did. It's so easy to doubt and trial and tribulation. It's so easy to, to speak against God. And I would stand up here lying to you this morning if I wasn't truthful with you and told you, God, I don't like you right now. I don't believe in you right now. Why do I have to go through this? Why do I have to live in a hospital for almost five months? Why, do my, why does my wife have to go through this? Not to mention life didn't stop. Bills didn't stop. Work didn't stop. We still had an eight and nine, uh, eight year old to, to raise. All these things still were happening. People were being knuckleheads and being weird around us, and we still had to live life and go through this. But why, God? Pick 21. Eventually, now we could say, fulfilled. Home, just as God promised. Family, no matter how undeserving and how messed up we are, we are still deeply loved by God. Without trial, we cannot appreciate the victory. That's why battles are fought and then won. The Bible says in Proverbs 24, 16, the godly may trip seven times, but they will get up again. One disaster, just one, is enough to overthrow the wicked. But when you have God on your side, you continue to get back up again. That's Emmy, mama. <laughs> this morning, if you are down, get back up again. If you are strong, stand strong. Regardless, God is the same. His promises are real and they will be fulfilled. I promise you that. I'm back today after nearly six months showing you that God is real, the miracles are real, and that your battle is not gonna go in vain, and that you're okay, and victory can come at the end of this, amen? Worship team, you can come up. So this morning, 
I wanted to, uh, before I release it fully to the worship team, I wanted to pray for you guys because there are some people in this room that are in the middle. Maybe you're at the beginning and you're feeling like, God, how can I get through this? How can I go through this? Even this congregation as a whole, we're not going to ignore that we lost a, a mother of our, of our congregation today and it doesn't hurt so how do we get through this? How do we get to the next level and to the next step? And we say, God, we need you. Your promises are real. So this morning, I want to pray that on you as a person who has just come out of a season telling you, you know what? I think we can do this. I'm going to release that we can on you this morning. If you would just stand and believe, I believe God has something for you this morning. Amen. Father God, right now, we come before you thanking you because of your miracles, but we also do not neglect to thank you for your trials, for the trials, for the tribulations, Father God, because with each step that we take, we're getting stronger. We're getting closer to your miracle, Father. Right now, regardless of where you stand, regardless of what you're going through, I pray a fresh wind right now of anointing, a fresh wind right now of possibilities. I pray a fresh wind and a renewal of your strength right now. I pray for renewed faith right now in Jesus' name. Some of you here are standing on your last. Some of you here are broken and are struggling, and that's okay, because the Bible says that can happen. But this morning, God wants you to know that I'm here. Now stand. you raise and receive right now, I believe there's an anointing, a fresh anointing that's going to fall right now in Jesus' name. Receive it in Jesus' name. Fresh. Fresh right now in Jesus' name. reality is that tomorrow there still will be trial my my twins are only about four months old or just about to be so I know that there's still more to come right I know that tomorrow brings more situations and more trials but you know what bring it you know I'm not going to stay here and be defeated and be scared or have anxiety about what's to come when I know that God is in control. It's so easy to, to be consumed by what, but what if, but what if, but what if? How about this? What if God is there already, just like he was the last time? What if God is already there saving you just like he did yesterday and the day before? What if we just stop doubting and let God be God? Imagine. Now it hits me where that one the scripture says, just rejoice during this time because God will be God. Just rejoice, eat, drink, be happy because God will be God. What if we smile through trial? What if we smile through tribulation because we already knew like, you know, what's funny is that as hard as this is, I know it's going to be okay already. What if I told you that I knew the end already to that trial and it was going to be fine? That's what I'm telling you right now, that it's going to be okay. That God is in control and what God wants it will happen and you will be okay. And you will be stronger and you will be wiser and you will be m m even better than you were yesterday. So receive that new strength right now in Jesus' name. Receive that new, that new anointing right now in Jesus' name. 
we pray.
than your circumstance right now. Just say, you have overcome the world. Greater than your trial. Took the keys from death and death. Greater than your pain. Joy in heaven, we declare, you're greater, greater. Come on, lift your voice and say, you have overcome the world. Took the keys from death and hell. Joy in heaven, we declare, you're greater. You have overcome the world. You have overcome the world. Took the keys, Took the keys from death and hell. Oh, oh. Join in heaven, we declare your greater, greater. You have overcome. You have overcome the world. Took the keys from death and hell. Join in heaven, we declare your greater, greater. death is not the end for us because this is just a short time that we spent here oh God and we thank God that we don't spend it alone but Father there's even a greater time for us a greater purpose and that is spent with you in eternity oh God so that is the goal that we run toward that is the prize that we want to attain oh God with you Everlasting with you. 
surrounded, overwhelmed, overcome by your love with you is where we want to be in your presence forevermore with you. And even though we grieve today over our sister in the past, with you is where she is right now. And we're almost a little envious, Father, because with you is where we long to be. So we trust you, God. You are, you are not finished with us. But if we're still here, that means there's more purpose to, for us to live out here. So live out your purpose, people of God. You are blessed to be a blessing. Have a wonderful week.